So hi, once again, many of you know me, I'm Elliot, I run the Bay Area Tabletop Devs Meetup, and I organize this, and I also work at Victory Point Cafe, and as such, I spend a lot of time interacting with a lot of board games, and I thought I could impart some useful information from you. Um, so this title's called Lessons uh, from a Game Guru at Victory Point Cafe. The original title was I Now Know an Upsetting Amount About Board Games. So if you don't know, Victory Point Cafe is a board game cafe. It's over in Berkeley. It's on Shattuck and Delaware. Um, it's a cafe. You can get coffee. You can get a vanilla latte. You can get pastries. It also has food and sandwiches, snack bowls. We have a decent beer selection and all of that. Uh, but primarily, it's about a curated board game experience. So you pay $5. You get to play as many games as you like from a library of over 800 games and there is someone there who can help you through that experience. So this is different to Endgame Cafe here in Oakland, if you guys are familiar with it. So Endgame is a board game store further down Broadway, and they now have a cafe, which is a nice little cafe that's kind of attached to the board game store that happens to have some board games in it. But that's not a board game cafe. We have board games first and cafe second. So my role there is a game guru. I've been doing that for about six months now. Uh, primarily, what I do is I recommend games and then I teach people how to play them. That is 70% of what I do there. Um, I'm sort of the gatekeeper to the wider world of gaming and kind of, you know, people have played Settlers of Catan, maybe Tickets to Ride in a Pandemic, and they want to know what else there is. And it's like, ah, come with me, my child. Let me show you the depths of this hobby. Um, this is often confusing and amazing for customers. They're like, wow, what an awesome job. Or like, what do you mean that's your job? Like, yeah, I'm here to serve you a game. Like that guy serves you food. I serve you a game. Um, also, I also like, look after the inventory and do all of help with cleaning and bussing tables and preparing food and all the other kind of stuff you expect from working in a cafe. Um, the reason I bring this up is because board game cafes are not new. Victory Point is the first one in the Bay Area. But Snakes and Lattes has been in Toronto since 2010, and I don't even know if that's the first one. There's also Game House in LA, Uncommons in New York City. They've been around since about 2013. There's like another one in Brooklyn. Um, there's Chance Encounters just opened up last year in Bristol, England. Uh, this is just to name a few. Uh, I've had people from Cleveland come into Victory Point and go, oh wow, this is like a smaller version of my one back home. Like, this is, this is a growing trend. And I think going forward, it's going to be a main way a lot of people interact with board games. And I think as designers, that's something you should consider. So why is it a growing trend? It's because there's increasingly tabletop games are becoming more popular. A lot of nerd culture, quote unquote, is becoming more mainstream. There's also just a lot more games coming out with Kickstarter, which is a great way to also market and promote the games. More people are hearing about them. But there's still a lot of people like, I want to try that but they don't have an in-depth knowledge. Uh, board game cafes also fit into our on-demand culture. A few years ago, do you remember how we didn't have Netflix and Spotify? It's, we we're kind of living in an on-demand culture and it's an affordable way to play a lot of games without actually having to build a whole collection. It's just, sometimes it's just $5 and you can play eight different games in your visit. So it's kind of more affordable than buying a bunch of board games. So how does your board game fit into your market is kind of the overall theme to this talk. So before I move into the meat of my talk, I just want to note a few things you can use a board game cafe for. Um, first and foremost, you can get people playing your game and finding about it because it's on the shelf. And I can recommend it to people. I can teach them how to play it. And now they've played your game and now they might want to buy it or at least teach other people how to play it. And it spreads and it circulates. That being said, though, do more than just drop off a copy. You know, hang about if you can and teach the staff how to play it and how to play the game and now they might like it and they might recommend it to other people. Uh, we had one recently called Dragoon, um, which was, I think, made kickstarted by some people in Boston. They kind of got how d dropping off a game at a board game cafe works, right? It's got the website on the box. It's got their Twitter handle. It's got about their Kickstarter. They've got buttons with their Twitter handle. They've got business cards so we can email the lead designers. Just something to consider. Board game cafe is also excellent resource for you to measure and compare to other games. So you're building a deck builder. Go play every deck builder in the closest board game cafe you find and understand every all of them. Um, or quite literally measure them. What is the average size of a board? What is actually the dimensions of the pandemic board? Um, obviously also bring your game to designer night, first Wednesday uh, of every month in Victory Point. So most of you I met there, so you guys don't really need to know that, but 
if um if you move away, um, find a board game cafe, go to their designer night. If they don't have designer night, start one because this runs into run events for your game. The most of the stuff at board game cafes are busy being, you know, serving people and kind of running a cafe. If you're like, hey, for no charge, I'll put on an event and I'll draw about twenty people. Great, do it. Bring, you know, laboratory mayhem guys. I've been really good at having tournaments very regularly, teaching people to play the game getting people the word out about it, running regular tournaments, and we're just happy to host them because they're local designers, and it's an event that we don't have to do anything about. It just sort of happens. And also, uh, I wanted to do a whole part of the talk on this, but look at what happens to a game after it's been played for a year. I've got some wonderful gore stories. I may do a whole separate blog just on what happens to some of these games after they get a lot of play. Uh, don't put stickers on nice plastic chips. If you've paid the money for a nice plastic chip, it's nice. The sticker does not look good after a year. It's like gluey. Oh, it's horrible. Don't, don't do that. All right. Me to my talk. I want to talk to you guys about what I need as a guru. And I'm going to focus on the demographics or the type of people we get coming in and I serve what games I'm recommending to them and why, and why I don't recommend other games, and then where there's space for uh, you guys uh, to design games, where I'm like, hey, I wish I had blank in this scenario that keeps happening to me, but no one's made a game that fits that. So we're gonna jump in with our first need, and that's couples. 80 to 90% of the people who come into Victory Point are a couple, like overwhelmingly so. Um, it's a really popular date spot because it's well lit, the music's not loud, it's kind of neutral to play board games and meet someone on the first date. Um, there's alcohol, but there's not an assumption that you're going to drink alcohol like meeting someone in a bar. There's also food. It's kind of a really, really good date spot. These people are usually newer to gaming. Uh, that's true for most people um, who come in, actually. Um, basically, if you know games and you want to come play Twilight Struggle or Scythe, you, you, you're taken care of. You don't need me. Um, so the people I'm talking to are usually people who need recommendations, but that still does seem to be most of the people. Uh, with couples, it can be 50-50, though, because sometimes it's like, hey, I like board games. I'm going to take this person on a date and play board games with them, and then I get to play board games, whatever, how the date goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um... Also, a lot, another thing with couples, they want to talk, right? The emphasis is on the social experience and less on a competitive gameplay experience. Um, something that they can just kind of stop, like timeline, and just talk for like 20 minutes over a beer, that's actually really good. Um, and they're not always a uh, in-love romantic couple. Sometimes it's just two bros who love playing board games together and like come in and play something hard, more hardcore like uh, Seven Wonders Duel or Twilight Struggle together. Uh, or parents and children, but I'll talk more about them later. Okay, so my top couple recommendations. Nia, Diamond in the Rough. This game needs more recognition. It's basically Connect 4, but the clever thing is, is everything I do on my turn will determine where you can place tiles on your turn. So it's Connect 4 with an added layer of subtle strategy that's easy to learn, but quite difficult to master. You've always got to be thinking two turns ahead. And Nier is a great one for new people who are gaming. It's like, oh, you know Connect 4? Here's Connect 4, but a little bit more interesting. And I've had people love it for that. Uh, even experienced gamers. It's just such this clever little tweak to it. Really good. Uh, Jaipur, straight up the best two-player card game there is. Hands down. Great one to give to new people, as Nick said. Um, it's, it's fast. It's fun. It's straightforward, but there's plenty of depth to it. You can give someone who's really into their games and someone who's totally new to games the same one, and they will both have a great time playing Jaipur. Uh, Hanabi is another great one because it's cooperative. Um, it involves sequences and numbers, which some people newer to games are kind of a bit more comfortable with. Um, and you don't win or lose. You just get a score, and that's how well you did. It's nice. It's pleasant. Um, actually, though, I give out Forbidden Island the most. And here's the reason. It's a board game. And that seems kind of obvious, but most of these other ones are card games or light games. And actually having a little token that you pick up and you move around the map and that's you and I can see all of the information that I need to make my decision in front of me, really good for people who are newer to games. Forbidden Island's cooperative. Everything you need to know is in front of you and it's pretty obvious where the threats are. It's really good for people who are newer to games. It's fine with two players and it is exactly 30 minutes. 
A lot of games have a lot of timer on how long it takes. They're all wrong. They're all wildly wrong. Forbidden Island is exactly 30 minutes. I would bet money and time you. Win or lose, it's 30 minutes. So uh, it's really, really nice and reliable. And then other ones, uh, Timeline. It's a, a lot of people are kind of intimidated by the fact it's a trivia game. Uh, but it is a pretty nice casual one. Imhotep, a uh, second idea for this talk was Imhotep is the perfect game. You don't need to make a game ever again. You just need to play Imhotep. Uh, <laughs> love it. It's perfect. Uh, Mr. Jack's kind of fun because it's asymmetrical and again fits into my board game recommendation for newer gamers. Uh, Pandemic, I don't usually teach because most people already know it. Um, but sometimes I do teach Pandemic. Uh, Elkfest is just kind of fun because it's physical. You're like flicking tokens at each other. And then Patchwork and Only Tama are also nice, good two-player games. All right. So designing for couples, uh, we need more. Just hands down, more two-player games. Games that are built around the idea of being two people were not that common a while ago. If they were, they were Magic or Netrunner, which is kind of not what I'm talking about. That's fine, but that's for a competitive tournament base. Like, I get a lot of people like, Oh, I want to buy a game, but it's usually me and my partner, and sometimes we have friends over. What scales well? Or, like, what can I play with just, like, my husband and wife when the kids are at school? And, you know, a lot of couples now are reaching maturity and they're into board games and are accessible, but they're still just two people. Um, so, more, 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 more. Um, I do prefer something physical and something gateway, like I said about Connect 4 and Nia. It's a good transition. Um, building on Existing presumptions about board games is not a bad way to go if you want to build something for to get more people into the hobby. Um, that being said, there's still room for strategy. Um, the most strategic, specifically two-player game we have before you get up to like Twilight Struggle is probably like Seven Wonders Duel is a nice heavier two-player game. And I think there's room for more stuff around that level or a little bit lower. Because sometimes I get people who are like, Oh, can, you know, we want something competitive, we want something a bit more strategic, and like, how about Jaipur? And like, we've already played it, and we, we want something like a notch above that, like something a little bit more, but not quite Seven Wonders Duel. So there's, some, there's still room for something, a mid-level strategy. Pet peeve I just wanted to cover, don't say your game's two players when it's really not. I know publishers do this to sell more boxes, but does it really sell more games to just try and trick people? Uh, Codename says it's two players. It's a team-based game. It's minimum four people. <laughs> Masquerade, it's two-player variant, is each person plays as two people, admitting it's a four-player game minimum. Like, it's just, don't, if you haven't got a good two-player variant, don't, don't, just skip everything I've said. You know, you've made, you've not made a two-player game, that's fine. Next category are six-plus groups, maybe even eight-plus groups are uh, kind of the other end of the spectrum. You know, usually three to four players, pretty easy to set up. They've already picked Catan, Ticket, or Pandemic, or maybe I'll give them Imhotep, maybe I'll give them Forbidden Island. But when it gets bigger, it gets more awkward. Um, usually there are a very broad range of experience levels from someone who wants to take charge of the whole evening, and they're really into the games, and that's great to see, but maybe everyone else in their group has never played board games before. So again, we're dealing with a lot of people who are newer to gaming. Um, and once... the you get these thresholds, you just cut out a lot of games that I'd normally recommend. So like Imhotep, Ticket to Ride, great four-player game, all ages, no problem. Um, you get a five people, maybe something you said makes me want to push you towards something else, but Dixit and Hanabi and Small World, they all cut out at six people. And there's been times I'm like, oh, everything you've, because I do like a little like query, like I get, try and get what kind of experience they want, what kind of games they've played before, if any. I try and get a, you know something out of them that makes me give them a good recommendation. And sometimes Dixit would be ideal, but they're six people. Moving on. Um, so And then other good ones are Coup, Crossing, and Pandemic are really good, solid games that I like to give out a lot. But they cap out at six people. And with these bigger groups, sometimes they're not ready to learn. Um, it's not that they don't want to, but maybe they've gotten together for a special occasion and it's someone's birthday and they haven't seen each other for a long time and there's a pitcher of beer flowing and something that's going to take me a while to teach them, they're not necessarily ready for. Um, they kind of want to just jump in and get started. And also people coming later is a big problem with these groups because they rarely all come at once. It's usually three people turn up and they want to play something in about 15 minutes before their fourth person turns up and then another two people come 20 minutes after that and then they're expecting another two people but another three people show up. And so it, the group grows 
and there are a few games you can just kind of stop and just deal in new people. So what are my recommendations? Uh, my troublesome recommendations are these ones. Um, I love giving resistance to people who are new in, newer to games because it's it's easy. You're a spy and you're trying to wreck the mission or you're a good guy and you're trying to find out who the other good guys are. That's it. Everything else is social deduction. There's no resource management. There's no decision tree. There's nothing. There's just you and arguing with your friends and finding out how much you hate them. Uh, it's brilliant. <laughs> but minimum five people and then maximum seven people. So it's a very narrow window when I can recommend it. Um, Mysterium, I give out a lot, which is it's sort of troublesome because Mysterium is a solid 20-minute teach. Maybe it's not actually that bad, but you have to walk them through the whole setup of the game and explaining, in the, explaining them through the whole process, which wouldn't be so bad if the rule book wasn't atrocious. And it's like, there's no, oh, I need to go help my friend do bust this table or deal with that order. Like, no, I'm, I'm into a Mysterium Teach. I'm committed because if I don't explain everything, you will never be able to play this game. Um, that being said, actually playing it on your turn is really easy. So it's great for larger groups. It's great for families, but it's just a lot of setup. Uh, betrayal, surprisingly easy to learn. I've never actually had any problem with people learning Betrayal. It's actually really, really good, especially if they want a longer experience like that. All right, those are my troublesome recommendations. The ones I usually go to are then, uh, well, my personal favorite is the Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards Jewel and Melt Skulls Fire. It's amazing. Um, it's fun, it's fast paced, but it has just enough strategy to keep you interested and blowing each other up with face melting magic is great. It is a bit niche, though. Uh, you've got to kind of have a Rick and Morty, Brutal Legend kind of sense of humor. There is a card called the Testa Kill. So if you're not into that, you're probably not going to like this game. But um, sometimes I've had really good, like, people have absolutely loved it when I've given them this game because it just fit the tone that they were looking for. Uh, another one I like to give out is Masquerade. It's basically the party version of Coup. It's really good in that um, it goes up to 13 people. And there are a few games that allow me to go up to 13 people. And it's not so bad that you can actually just stop and do setup again when someone else arrives. Um, and that actually makes the game more interesting the more people you have in it. Uh, Cockroach Poker is also another great one. It's just uh, lying and playing pretty straightforward forward rules actually there's not too much about it to learn and then dead last um very similar to cash and guns it's a very fun very fast-paced action game uh where you will vote to shoot someone and if the majority that person dies whoever didn't vote with the majority also dies so you can it can be decided pretty quickly and then you have a final showdown to play uh play some special cards and trying to steal some gold uh it is also known as reservoir dogs the game it's basically that but it actually suffers from being too fast. In about 20, 30 minutes into it, you're like, right, that's uh, that's sort of it. Like, it's not, um, uh, people kind of burn through it pretty quickly. And then I wind up recommending something else to them. Um, another good one is Bang, but I honestly have trouble teaching that to people because you've got uh, the cards you play, your hidden roles, and then the characters that give you special power-ups, which you need to know like sort of giving that seems like an obvious thing to give at the start of setup but you need to know the entire game to understand why card draw is good in this certain situation and things like that it's a bit of a pain to teach but it is a really good game uh deception werewolf code names all also really good party games uh, and concepts great uh we mentioned it briefly before i think but um it's it's more of a mechanism for social experience than it is a game so it really kind of excels in that so those are what I usually give out. Um, so when it comes to designing for these large groups, there are a lot of party card games. Like, there's a lot. Um, and this kind of breaks my usual board game guideline for people who are newer to games. Like, I want to give them something where they can see the information in front of them and they're not relying on hidden information. And when it comes to these party games, there's a lot of deception and treachery, right? We've got Bang, Werewolf, Resistance, Betrayal, House on the Hill, Coup, Skull, Cash and Guns, Deception, Dead Last, Cockroach Poker, Secret Hitler, Masquerade, more and more. Many of these are my favorite games, my favorite style of game to play. But when it comes to groups that are like six, seven, or eight people or larger, they're all the same kind of game that I wind up recommending to them. Um, only Mysterium, Concept, or Betrayal really differ um, in terms of like theme and tone that they're getting. 
So they're really very strategic. I would say Seven Wonders is an exception, but perhaps that's a bit too heavy for the role I serve. Um, I would, l I really think there is room for a more classic Ticket to Ride, Settlers of Catan style, straight up board game that plays six to eight people. I would really be interested in something like that um, because the Catan with the five and six player expansion is probably the most played game at Victory Point. All right. My needs is a guru number three, children's and families. Um, I want to tell you a little story to open this. Uh, there was a father who came in with a five-year-old and a six-year-old, and he got Settlers of Catan off the wall. And like I said, normally I don't, I don't want to tell people don't do that, but I'm here if you need me. And he was like, oh, I think I've got it. And he taught his five-year-old and six-year-old Settlers of Catan. They sat there quietly, and they listened. And then the five-year-old beat him, and I'm pretty sure the dad didn't mean to lose. <laughs> When it comes to children games, I just want to say they're newer to games. They're not incapable. They probably have had as much experience playing games as most other people who walk into a board game cafe. That being said, regulars, children's are different. There's a father and son who comes in almost like every week. Uh, they play Terraforming Mars together because that's the kind of thing they do. And when it comes to kids, it's kind of about mindset. Like, you know, this is the thing he does with his dad and he knows what to expect at Victory Point. And they sit down quietly and they learn really heavy strategy games and they really enjoy playing them together. Like, that's that's dad time and that's what they do in that time and that's great to see. But there is so much junk marketed towards kids. It's just awful, awful. It's not even a good game or something that will give them a good gameplay experience. It's just a jumped up toy. But with kids, they are sometimes too excited. I don't blame them. This is not actually unlike the large groups. They're somewhere new. They're, it's a special occasion, and they're excited, maybe. <laughs> Grandma's looking after them uh, from mum and dad, giving them a break, and they've just had ice cream, and they've just been to the park, and it's the end of the big day, and it's really, all these games, and there's noise, and it's exciting. Like, yeah, it is. Um, it's a really exciting place to be. So the only really real limitations of children are the language, maybe attention span, and general knowledge. Um, you know, don't play time. I wouldn't give timeline to kids. It's difficult. Um, the other bigger problem with children and family is they usually wind up being a two or a three, um, which then takes your existing pool of games and then cuts it down to other things you can recommend them. More often than not, you've got like a six to an eight year old, 12 to 13 year old, a mum. And how do you get a game that they can all play together that the 12 year old won't think is childish, that isn't too complex for the six year old, something to bridge that? is Ticket to Ride, and that's why it's the greatest selling game of all time. Okay, my recommendations, Crossing. Really, really good. Uh, really fun. You go 3, 2, 1, and you point. If you're doing one pointing at a mushroom, you take all of the gems on that mushroom, and then you put it on your character. And guess what? You can also point to characters, take all the gems from the characters. So it's really fun, really fast-paced. It's that, ha gotcha feeling, which a lot of people, a lot of people come in and say, can you recommend something fun? I was like, oh, good, I was going to recommend you something really unfun. But, <laughs> but I think what they mean is crossing. They mean that, aha, that like adrenaline rush of like the reveal. Um, and crossing is really good for that. And I've given this to a group of like 30-year-olds, and they've also had as much fun and delight as a family with kids. Uh, Spot It's also really good. Um, visual puzzle. So kids, like I said, avoid language, avoid knowledge, but you give them a visual puzzle and they will surprise you. Um, and it's as good with large groups as well. Uh, concepts, just also solid, but it doesn't play so well with children because of the general knowledge requirement. But um, it's certainly f a good one for families and a more family-oriented board game. You don't really, it's not really intense. There's not intimidating. There's no winners or losers. Uh, King of Tokyo, I find, is an interesting one. I really enjoy it. It's a really fun game, but I don't think it works as a three-player game. And I don't like its five- to six-player variant, so it's exactly four players and nothing else to me. Um, but I think it has the right amount of simple decisions, uh, s clear goals, everything in you need to know is in front of you, and a little bit of like strategy of like building items and bulking up. Um, and then another one is Mysterium, is great for families and children. Because even though, like I said, it's a long teach and it's a big setup, uh, the actual gameplay is really straightforward. It's visual, the ghost, uh, maybe I should have said before, um, it's basically Cluedo with a ghost. Um, so the ghost is trying to give you clues on how they were murdered and is giving these Dixit-like, really trippy, dreamy, ethereal like imagery. So everything you need to know is in front of you and then you get the clue. Great for newer people, great for families, great for children's. And if you take that 12-year-old and you make her the ghost, 
she has the time of her life. Uh, I can tell you this from my experience as a teacher and like working workshops and science museums. Children respond really positively to being given responsibility. So I've definitely had a really good time giving Mysterium out to families. And the younger kids can still play it. And then the middle kids love being the ghost. And then mum and dad still can kind of get the game and can... Dixit's also another great one. Hey, look, Imhotep's back. You should buy Imhotep. It's the greatest game ever. Uh, Ticket Ride's also very good. Riff Raff, I feel like, should be really good. But they get too excited by trying to balance stuff. And they don't really take turns doing it. And they just kind of like keep knocking stuff over. Um, so designing for children, um, don't think of them as less able. They're essentially just newer. They just had less time playing. Maybe actually with sometimes the parents about as much experience playing board games. Sometimes more. Um do would like to emphasize physical and tactile. It's been kind of a theme when I'm dealing with a lot of newer gamers. They want to be able to see everything in front of them and interact with it. Um, uh, if you do want to make a kid's game, though, don't make it a messy one, please. Please. It's just, when it comes to a board game cafe, like, Jenga's nice, but it goes everywhere, and I have to sweep up all the pieces off the floor and all this and that, and pieces go missing. Um, it just doesn't need to make a mess. Um... And coming back to the Mysterium point, children really do want to feel empowered. And if you can offer them some kind of a role that has responsibility, then I think you're onto a game that is great for families. Cool. Any questions?